Hello my dear students. In this video, we are going to have a talk on the poem Sunset on Portage written by George Kenney. George Kenney is a Canadian poet and playwright belonging to the indigenous Anishinaabe community. The Anishinaabe community is a group of culturally related indigenous peoples resident in Canada and the United States. It includes the tribes like Odawa, Saltox, and Ojibwe. George Kenny belonged to the Ojibwe tribe, the third largest tribe on North America. Ojibwe is known as Chippewa in the United States. George Kenny lived on the Laxiul Reserve in Ontario. He learned traditional ways from his parents before being sent to residential school in 1958. He left the reserve at the age of six and grew up in small northwestern Ontario towns. His writing reflects experiences in both native and non-native worlds. His book, Indians Don't Cry, published in 1977, is a landmark in the history of indigenous literature that reflects the cultural survival of Aboriginal people. Through this book, he joined the ranks of indigenous writers such as Maria Campbell, Basil Johnston, and Rita Jo, whose works melded art and political action. Hailed as a landmark in the history of indigenous literature in Canada, this book inspired a new generation of Anishinaabe writers with poems and stories that depict the challenges of indigenous people confronting and finding ways to live within urban settler society. George Kenny dedicated this book to his father and mother. Indians Don't Cry describes his life in the Laxiul Reserve in Ontario and the contributions of his parents in molding him as a writer. His father was a trapper and laborer, but he never discouraged George from becoming a writer. His mother encouraged him to finish school. The book was later made into a radio play and videotape called October Stranger. The poem Sunset on Portage is taken from this book titled Indians Don't Cry. Now about the poem Sunset on Portage. Through the short eight-lined poem Sunset on Portage, George Kenny exposes the grave reality of man's trial to dominate the powers of nature. The poem is presented from a native's perspective, thereby portraying how the Ojibwe community views the reckless and ruthless environmental changes due to creeping in of modernity, non-sustainable development, and even the alienation of man. The scene of the poem is set in Winnipeg, the capital city of Manitoba, Canada. Now into the text of the poem. Sunset on Portage from the bus depot. The Winnipeg sun dies lastly on the blue logo of the Bank of Montreal, fluorescent and neon lights man's creation, surplans, God's technology. So as I have already mentioned, including the title and the subtitle, the poem comprises of 10 lines. So it is a very short poem. The poem goes like this, Sunset on Portage from the bus depot, the Winnipeg sun dies lastly on the blue logo of the Bank of Montreal fluorescent and neon lights, man's creation surplants God's technology. So while reading the first part of the poem, we may feel that the poet is about to describe a dusk. But the coming lines make us realize that the poet is actually presenting the grave reality of man's trial to dominate the powers of nature. This can be analyzed in comparison with the technology-driven human lives with the pristine life of nature. Man's pride is signified by the fluorescent and neon lights. The light reflecting on the blue logo of the Bank of Montreal is also significant as the Bank of Montreal refers to the Canadian multinational banking and financial services. 
it is one of the five big banks in Canada. Bank of Montreal is one of the five big banks in Canada. The notion that man's creation surplants God's technology becomes very much crucial to the theme of the poem. Uh, hence, the last three lines are highly significant. The association of the word creation with man and technology with God is uh, very much striking because the usual association of God with creation and man with technology is subverted as a result of which the roles are inverted. Man becomes the creator. The irony involved here is that man becomes the destroyer of his own future. Here man becomes the powerful authority who overpowers God. The word surplant is critical in the reading of the poem. Surplant here refers to the attempts of human beings to overpower God. The natural environment is disturbed with the artificial advancement, resulting in a very materialistic society. It can also be considered as a climax of spiritual decline of industrialization that got set up in the 18th century, uh, the apex of uh, globalization, capitalism and consumerism. The pollution and environmental hazards associated with these are also significant. Man wants to supplant the natural order. He wants to make the night look like a day. He wants to drive away darkness with his technology, with his fluorescent and neon lights. The famous American poet and literary theorist Kenneth Burke advocates an anti-technological humanism opposed to the current faith in big technology. If man has assumed that his technology could replace or triumph over God's technology, he should realize his error. In a way, this can be considered as the lament of the Ojibwe community because of the injustices occurred to their mother nature. For the aboriginal natives, this transition was not at all an easily acceptable phenomenon. The poem has a universal appeal. It facilitates a warning to the readers that unscientific and non-sustainable development and technological advancement will lead to the destruction of nature and the natural order. Thereby, it will lead to the destruction of human beings. As the ecologist Grigory Batterson commented, the creature that wins against the environment destroys itself. So that is the end of this session. Thank you.